Welcome, viewers and listeners, to another edition of CHP Talks. I'm here today with Carson Binda, and Carson is the BC Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Carson, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me on, sir. It's always exciting to uh, speak with people who care about lower taxes, less waste, and more accountable government. Amen. I've been hearing that a long time from the wonderful organization, Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Uh, how long have you been with the with the organization? Yeah, I'm coming on a year and a half now, so it's been an exciting time to learn about BC politics and get my boots on the ground uh, to see what we can do to fix the mess the politicians and bureaucrats are leaving us with. Wonderful. So uh, just for our viewers and listeners, I'm on a short introduction here. Uh, Carson Binda, as I mentioned, is the British Columbia Director for Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Before joining the CTF, he spent previous five years serving in senior positions on political campaigns across all levels of government, as well as studying at the University of British Columbia. Sounds like a busy lifestyle. Uh, before that, Carson spent 15 years living and studying on five continents where he has seen the best and worst of government and the human condition. So again, uh, Thank you for joining us today, taking time out of your work uh, schedule there, a busy work schedule. And and before we go into BC's debt and deficit and uh, budgetary problems, which are many and deep, um, what were those 15 years like? You, you were traveling around the world, essentially, with your family. Tell us about that. Yeah, you're right. Um, so my father was working in international development, uh, helping bring democracy, freedom of speech, fundamental values and freedoms to some of the most underdeveloped, underprivileged communities in the world. Um, I spent a lot of time in Yemen, which has been in the news a lot lately, unfortunately, for all the wrong reasons. Um, Kosovo, Nigeria, Malta, um, and now I'm here in Vancouver. So it was it was a whirlwind um, and it, it made me feel deeply privileged to be Canadian traveling to those contexts. Well, so many of the things we take for, for granted, the freedom of speech, the freedom to sit here and talk and be critical of our politicians. That's something that far too many people around the world just don't have. Um, the opportunity to make our voices heard in elections. That's another privilege that far too many people don't have. Um, so moving to those countries, those, those really difficult contexts, you do see the best and the worst of the human condition. You see the best and the worst of government. And you also see how bad government can have a huge impact on normal people. Uh, it drives home that old saying, take an interest in politics before politics takes an interest in you. <laughs> yeah, so many people think that they can ignore politics. They're, they're fed up with the, uh, you know, the lies and the spin and and uh, sort of the hubris of politics. But they some of them don't realize that unless we do something about it, it's only going to get worse. And uh, so I... I I think it's interesting your father was helping to bring democracy and freedom of speech to those countries and we're basically in our country it seems like we're throwing those out the back door right now so uh, I'm glad you're here speaking with us uh, we still do have freedom of speech and we have to exercise it use it or lose it is sort of where I'm at with uh, with those types of things so I noticed your article it came in an email, uh, which we get regular emails from Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Uh, you and your organization do great work. <clears throat> We've appreciated the uh, creativity as well as the uh, accuracy and and passion of you know all of your members from the directors uh, of provinces and so on for many years we've been members and we support the work of uh, canadian taxpayers federation but anyway i got this email from you about bc's uh debt and the upcoming um deficit that our members of the legislative assembly in victoria are planning to uh in incur this massive deficit 
to add to the existing uh, provincial debt in British Columbia. So, so tell us what that deficit is going to be in 2024, 2025, and what is our provincial debt? You can lay those numbers out for our listeners. Yeah, so just to provide some context, uh, the budget and fiscal plan, the three-year plan, was released uh, a few weeks ago. Everyone was down in Victoria, waiting with bated breath to get their hands on a copy of the budget. And sitting around the lock, or sitting in the lockup, looking around the room, you could tell that all of the stakeholders, the journalists, um, everyone was shocked by the numbers that were in there, and for good reason. Our government spending is ballooning, and that ballooning of government spending is leaving us with huge amounts of debt. So this year alone, by the end of this year, our province, BC, will be $123 billion in debt. Now, that's that's a huge number. That's eye-watering. That's uh, well over double what it was seven years ago when the NDP came to power. Um, with big debt comes big interest payments. So this year alone, British Columbians are going to be paying about $4.1 billion uh, towards the interest on the debt. Remember, that's not touching the principal. That's just on the interest payments. $4.1 billion is a lot of money. That's more money than we're spending on all but three ministries. It's more money than the government's collecting in the carbon tax and motor fuels tax combined. It's more money than we're spending on children and family welfare uh, this year. So that's a lot of money that British Columbians can't afford to be shoveling out the door right now. Exactly. I, I... I did a little calculation, and that looks to me like almost eleven thousand, no, eleven million dollars a day. Yeah, uh, yeah. ten million nine hundred fifty-eight thousand dollars every single day that we're paying. As you mentioned, just the interest on the debt that doesn't buy us any new roads or hospitals or schoolrooms or whatever. That's that's just paying the bankers. Exactly. It's just paying the bankers. And for every British Columbian, that shakes out to about $820 this year. Uh, I think if you went out and asked normal British Columbian families if they'd rather pay $820 in banking fees, essentially, for the province's debt, or keep that at home, put it towards their, their small business, put it towards putting a roof over their family's head, I think you'd have a hard time finding any British Columbians who want to send that money right out the door uh, to the bond fund managers. And, it, you know, you can say it's $4.1 billion this year, but over the next three years, it's going to be about $14.6 billion, which is almost $3,000 per British Columbian. So the debt interest payments are just taking a bigger and bigger and bigger chunk out of our provincial finances every single year. And instead of doing something about that, instead of starting to pay off that debt, running balanced budgets so we don't have to keep paying these increasing uh, interest payments, our province or provincial government is doing the opposite. They're planning on running deficits for the next three years at least, likely longer, big multi-billion dollar deficits that are going to result in more and more debt. And remember, folks, for the people listening at home, debt is just deferred taxation. Every dollar of debt that the province or the federal government, for that matter, racks up today is a dollar plus interest you and your family are going to have to pay back down the line through taxes. So these, these issues, public debt, it has real consequences for normal families like yours and mine. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that I, I mentioned to uh, you, Carson, before we started the program that I'm national leader of the Christian Heritage Party as well. Right now, I'm the provincial leader of the Christian Heritage Party of British Columbia, and both parties have a mandatory balanced budget policy. In other words, if we formed government, uh, spending money more, spending more than you have, using your credit card, uh, you know, to buy lunch is not on the table for us. We would... And unfortunately for taxpayers and voters who, you know, some voters have not 
figured this out that the, <laughs> that the the tax man is taken from one pocket and then when there's you know things that people want government to do uh it you know they might think oh this is a great government is giving us this and this and this they don't realize it's taking from our own pockets and from our children's pockets so unfortunately the kind of policies that need to be enacted in order to achieve balanced budgets are sometimes going to you know <laughs> not everyone's going to be happy about the kind of cuts that have to be made but then if we would stop wasting money on things we don't need uh, government programs we don't need, we would have, I think, enough money to do the things that we do need and that we should have in British Columbia and, in, of course, in Canada as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I like to think of provincial finances, federal finances, just like a family budget. Uh, if you need to make a roof repair, but you've already maxed out your credit card on dinners out and uh, foreign trips, you're going to have a hard time making that roof repair when you really need to. Provincial finances are the exact same. The more money we spend on frivolous luxuries as a province, the less money we have to reduce taxes at home or provide services when British Columbians really need them. And that's exactly what we're seeing in BC right now. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I I don't have a lot of patience with the uh, the financial approach that I hear often, um, debt to GDP ratio. In other words, uh, some people think, well, it's okay uh, to uh, run a deficit as long as the ratio is within bounds. Now, uh, I think the ratio itself is is uh, racing, is, is the proportion of debt to uh, GDP is, is growing dramatically. But I don't, I don't go along with that way of thinking. I think that uh, you you need to pay the debt down so that you're paying zero interest. And uh, it, like if these governments, if they think the spending is that important, they should be going to the taxpayers and saying, okay, we're going to have to, you know, be, let's be honest. These uh, projects or programs are going to cost us so much money. We're going to have to tax you for it. And I think... The the problem is that politicians tend to buy votes with uh, our ch grandchildren's money. <laughs> they they think they can kick this debt can down the road and uh, provide goods and services that'll make people happy who aren't going to have to pay today for them. But as you mentioned, as this debt grows, the portion of our taxes that are going to pay interest on the debt, I mean... Uh, nearly $11 million a day. Can anyone imagine that we're spending $11 million a day just on, you know, uh, paying the interest? Anyway, it's it's uh, disgusting, and we need to work together. All those uh, politicians, <clears throat> not only in our party, but in other parties who understand those principles, we need to work together to... Um, reverse this. And so you you talk to members of the Legislative Assembly uh, in various parties. What kind of response do you get on when you talk about debt and deficit? Yeah, I, you know, it's it's a mixed bag. I, I have to say off the top here, we are totally nonpartisan. Uh, we will never endorse any parties. We will never uh, do the opposite of endorsing any parties. We're totally politically neutral. Now, that being said, there are certain parties in the legislature that are pushing hard for increased debt. The government, our current government, being a good example. They are not laying out any plans to balance the budget today, not next year, not the year after that, no time in the future. Um, the two major opposition parties, BC United and uh, the BC Conservatives, have both been uh, far more receptive to balancing the budget and also importantly to tax cuts. British Columbians are taxed through the roof. We are spending a ton of money on everything because government keeps on jacking up the taxes on everything. Yeah. Um, so we need to see those parties that are pushing for more fiscal responsibility really keep hammering the provincial government on this because that's what this government's really weak on those affordability and fiscally responsible measures. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that 
uh, politicians, uh, they do need to be reminded. Like, uh, and if they don't hear from people like us, you know, they're going to assume that everybody's okay with this uh, continuing um, descent into the morass of uh, unaffordable debt. I mean, it is really unaffordable. Um, BC was one of the first uh, ones to uh, get on board with the carbon tax. Is that correct? Uh, well, yeah. Oh, my gosh. She hit a sore spot with me <laughs> mentioning the carbon tax. Yeah. yeah. So you're absolutely right. We are the first jurisdiction in Canada um, to introduce a carbon tax. And look, it hasn't worked. Since the carbon tax was introduced to today, there has been a steady increase in greenhouse gas emissions in British Columbia. There was a slight dip during the pandemic. That's true. I think that has a lot more to do with people staying home, with businesses being forced to close, than it did with the carbon tax. Um, that's just common sense as far as I can see it. Um, and the carbon tax makes literally everything more expensive. Think about the groceries you buy in the grocery store. Um, if you're buying a loaf of bread, that grain, when it was dried off farm, they paid a carbon tax to dry that grain. They paid a carbon tax to get it from the farm to the grain dryer. They pay a carbon tax to take it from the grain dryer to the bakery or the processing plant. Another carbon tax when they take it from the processing plant to the grocery store. Then you're paying a carbon tax when you hop in your car, go to Costco and buy that loaf of bread. So every single step of the way, the goods and services British Columbians need are hammered with this gigantic an increase in carbon tax from the provincial government. And we know that the carbon tax, it's wildly unpopular. Only seven, that's right, seven percent of British Columbians want to see an increase like the province is planning. When you've got a policy that only gets seven percent support, that's a pretty good indication that it's a bad policy. Um, but instead of being responsive to those British Columbians, those people who can't afford to feed their families anymore, the provincial government is doubling down on this failed policy and they're jacking up the carbon tax again on April 1st. So this April 1st, the EB government is playing a big joke on all those British Columbians who are concerned about affordability, who are concerned about feeding their families, heating their homes when the winter winds are howling. We're going to talk about uh, another, I'm going to ask you about another uh, aspect or something that's happening on April 1st. But before we get to that, um, I just want to state that we believe, first of all, the carbon tax has not been effective in curbing greenhouse gas emissions. But we, as a party, and myself as an individual, uh, we don't believe that um, the whole concept of of carbon emissions is even a thing. Uh, you know, it's it's become uh, you know whether you can reduce it or not. You know, we believe carbon dioxide is not a toxic uh, element. It's plants need it to grow, and uh, we don't. You know, we think the whole thing is is a hoax. Uh, as far as the planet warming due to uh, carbon dioxide emissions. But on top of that, this carbon tax uh, has not been effective, as you say, in even making a difference on on that level. Um, when it comes to April 1st, there's a couple of things, beside from uh, being April Fool's Day, uh, and I think Canadian taxpayers are being uh, treated as fools, and we don't deserve that uh, approach. We we deserve respect from those we elect to represent us. What's happening in Ottawa on April 1st? Oh, my gosh. Uh, Ottawa is another one of those words that just sends, <laughs> sends a shiver down my spine. Yeah. I like to joke that Ottawa is Mordor, the center of the evil bureaucracy. Yeah. But on April 1st, the MPs are taking a big fat pay raise. The same day, they're jacking up the federal carbon tax, jacking up uh, the escalator tax on things like beer, wine, and spirits. So the very same day that Justin Trudeau and his cabinet is making life less affordable for you and I by jacking up taxes on things like energy and alcohol, 
they're taking a big fat pay raise. So for backbench MPs, we're estimating that they're going to take about an $8,000 pay raise. For the prime minister, Mr. Trudeau, he's getting about an extra $16,000. And that's money that's coming right out of your and my pocket and going to the politicians. Now, they take pay raises every single year. Pre-pandemic, a normal MP, a backbencher, was making about $178,000 a year. By the end of, uh, after April 1st, they're going to be making about $202,000 a year. So their salaries are going up, 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 up. Now bear in mind here, according to Statistics Canada, the average salary for a full-time worker in Canada is only about $67,000. So these federal politicians, they are totally out of whack with what normal Canadians are experiencing, what normal Canadians are making. Backbench MP, 2019 uh, to now, 20, uh, 23, almost $24,000 increase to their base pay. The prime minister, he's gotten a, after April 1st, $50,000 just about more than he was making in 2019. So these are just gobsmacking amounts of money, gobsmacking pay raises that your average Canadian couldn't even dream of. Yeah, and of course they get on top of those, uh, on top of their salary, they have their expenses are paid. So, so they don't have to dig into their pocket uh, to to cover their travel when they're traveling uh, as a representative of the people and so on. Uh, their office expenses, all that is covered in addition. So it's, uh, and and that's been put in place, like they, their excuse is, well, that's all, it's kind of built in that goes automatically, like we didn't vote this year for a raise this year, but neither did they vote this year to end these uh, uh inappropriate raises at a time when many Canadians are are suffering the after effects of the COVID uh, lockdowns, the economic uh, disaster that has taken place in the last few years and the carbon taxes and all that. These these guys are, are getting a raise when everybody else is feeling the pinch. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And look, a line I hear a lot from politicians and their staffers is, well, we need the very best people in politics and the, the very best people come with a big fat price tag. Look, these people are supposed to be civil servants. They're supposed to be serving their communities, serving their country. Serving your country doesn't usually come with a big fat paycheck. But that's exactly what these politicians want. And that's unacceptable. It's unacceptable when our uh, economy is stagnating. It's unacceptable when more Canadians than ever are turning to food banks, uh, when many Canadians have less than $1,000 in their bank accounts at the end of the month, for our politicians to be jacking up the taxes on everything while lining their own pockets more, that's a slap in the face to, to families that are just scraping by, to all the small businesses that have closed in the past few years. It's insulting. Yeah. Carson, um, these are two huge topics. I mean, for British Columbians, I think this uh, provincial debt and deficit situation, I mean, we should really be concerned about that because it, it just shows a really... Um, a lack of uh, even realistic thinking by the people who are supposed to be thinking on our behalf of how to spend taxpayers' money. What's what you know prioritizing? Like in a household budget, uh, we we prioritize. We can't buy everything we see on the shelf or every car we see on a lot because we have a limited amount of resources and we have to decide which things are important. And these guys are seem to be thinking that they have to do everything that that uh, the if an idea comes across their desk, they have to do it. And they have to learn to say no <laughs> to uh, special interest groups on some of these issues. And where, where would you like to see, uh, you might have some ideas where BC could cut spending. Do you have some priorities there? 
Oh, absolutely, Rod. Look, finding savings in our bloated provincial budget, it's about as easy as finding a drop of water in the Salish Sea. <laughs> no problem at all. So to start with, we need to be cutting the perks for our provincial politicians. Let's give you just one example here. There's an MLA who represents a downtown Vancouver riding, a gentleman named Spencer Chandra Herbert. He spent more than 70 thousand dollars over the past three years on uh, on flights on travel including uh, private helicopter rides between vancouver and victoria look how can a civil servant possibly justify taking a helicopter back and forth billing taxpayers seventy thousand dollars for that luxury that's a luxury that's uh, out of the imagination of most British Columbian families, but it's something our politicians don't think twice about billing to us. That needs to end, those kinds of wasteful practices with our MLAs. Uh, beyond that, if we want to take sort of a bigger view, because we won't fix an $8 billion deficit by the politicians reigning in their personal budgets alone, we need to be taking a hard look at these FIFA games that BC has promised to host in 2026. So the last estimates we had, and we know these are out of date now, but the province and the city of Vancouver refuse to release uh, up-to-date estimates. So at the very least, this is going to cost us $260 million to host a handful of soccer games. How's that money being spent, you might ask? Well, I can see BC Place out my window here. They're building a brand, a brand new VIP entrance to BC Place. They're building brand new VIP suites at BC Place. They're even building a connector between BC Place and a nearby casino. You know, in case soccer gets too boring for the uh, bureaucrats and they want to take a little blackjack break. These are the things that taxpayers, you and I, are paying for uh, to host the FIFA World Cup. That's a slap in the face, quite frankly. Paying for all these luxuries so the FIFA elites won't even have to uh, mingle with the unwashed masses who are paying for them to live this life of luxury. Beyond that, we also need to scrap corporate welfare. BC government is handing out hundreds of millions of dollars to big corporations. That's money leaving families and going towards big business. That's a problem. Uh, so the, the province spent $80 million on a, on a Taiwanese battery company called E1 Molly Cell for them to build a new facility. There's an entire investment uh, group, it's bureaucrats role-playing as investment bankers, called the NBC Investment Corps. It's a $500 million slush fund that, like I said, the bureaucrats use to invest and, and just role-play as finance bros. So those are good places to start trimming the fat around the provincial budget. But what we really need is just a culture shift with our politicians and bureaucrats in Victoria. We need to take a hacksaw to the growth in the bureaucracy that has occurred over the past few years. Um, so from 2016 to 2023, we've seen a 31% increase in the core bureaucracy. That's very expensive. Now for, for context, the core bureaucracy, that's ministerial staffers. It's not people like uh, teachers, nurses, bus drivers. So we can see the government reigning in that core bureaucracy, um, trimming the fat around that core bureaucracy, while also taking a hatchet to things like corporate welfare, the FIFA World Cup, and all the perks the politicians are taking. Yeah, and of course we in the Christian Heritage Party, we uh, certainly oppose the use of health care dollars for things like gender transition. And, and you know, we don't think... Uh, BC benefits from providing free street drugs to people who formerly, uh, you know, we were trying to help them get off drugs. And now we think it's, uh, or the, the government seems to think it's a good idea to hand out drugs. And that's not working for sure. Uh, it's not helping people find a pathway back to sanity. Um, and then I've heard this, I don't know the number in British Columbia, but I've heard huge numbers in the, in the U S um, the number of teachers that have, you know, the percentage of increase in teachers 
compared to the percentage of increase in administrative staff in, in the education system. And I presume it's uh, similar in British Columbia that uh, the the bureaucracy uh, seems to grow. The administrative bureaucracy grows faster than the frontline workers. And that might be true in healthcare, might be true in policing. And uh, how we can cut back on that seems like everybody's trying to make sure that they, uh, you know, there's the whole concept of liabilities. So they put, you know, lawyers to work drafting documents when they could be just getting the job done, right? So, Yeah, you're absolutely right. And in way too many of these civil services, they're incredibly top-heavy. There's far too many managers uh, making six-figure salaries and not enough teachers, nurses, and bus drivers. So we need to see a culture shift there. We need to be supporting the teachers, the nurses, the police officers, instead of growing that huge administrative uh, bureaucracy that's on top of them. Right. Yeah. And and it would be nice. I don't know how we we break this uh, cycle of uh, it, it's a human uh, condition or, a, you know, it's human nature, but the politicians using taxpayer dollars to buy votes. And that's uh, really sad. But it is the reality is that uh, people think they're getting something for nothing. And uh, the reality is they're they're paying for it and our children will be paying for it as well. So, uh, Carson, any last words you have for our viewers and listeners today? Yeah, uh, well, start with thank you so much for having me on your show today, sir. But beyond that. I think we need to see British Columbians getting more involved in these issues. Uh, if you think, as a listener, if you think that this debt, this deficit, these interest payments are out of control, make that heard. Write an email to the finance minister, go to taxpayer.com and sign some of our petitions. But we have a voice. We have the ability to make change in this province. We can't let that ability, that right, that freedom go to waste. Absolutely. Carson Binder, Binda, I'm sorry, uh, BC Director for the Canadian Taxpayer Federation. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, we wish you good success in the days and years ahead. And, and uh, thank you for what you're doing to hold politicians accountable to, to their constituents and especially the taxpayers thank you so much sir take care okay